Hi and welcome. I'm Meredith and I'm here with Sarah and we are iRebel and we're coming to you on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Hi Sarah. Hi Meredith. So what's our topic for today? We're going to talk about Valve, a gaming yes. company out in Washington. So we've discovered another unforeseen indicator that the old model of state power is becoming obsolete and new models are developing alongside the old. Sounds good. Yeah. So we found a few different articles about Valve, this gaming company. Mm -hmm. And one of them was from Forbes. Which I really like this article from Forbes. Actually, I like all of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, this one was short and sweet. And, uh, and, you know, we can go over what it's talking about. Um, it's just basically talking about Valve and, and how they sort of have a different business model than all the rest. So we can go into that. But I'm just thrilled that that this is news, that all of these articles are talking about this kind of thing. I mean, these, these words in here are awesome. Um, so, I you know, as we talk about the articles, I have a couple quotes in this particular Forbes article that I want to just touch on kind of to show that. Um, yeah, it's very fascinating mm -hmm. to see that there's there are quite a few recent articles covering this new management style. Mm -hmm. So um, the title of the Forbes article is Valve's Michael Abrash Hierarchical Management bottlenecks innovation. So it's kind of saying uh, that if you have hierarchy in management, um, it sort of stifles innovation and, and Valve has taken note of this and now has this sort of, uh, well, non-hierarchical uh, business model. So, um, yeah. It's <laughs> That's what that's saying. Yeah. So, um, did you, was there anything in particular you wanted to highlight about? Yeah. Um, what there were author saying. Mm -hmm. There was there were a couple really cool um, just quotes that I saw in here. It sort of doesn't quite have to do with the the content. Uh, sort of, but it's at one point he says in the article, "Don't mistake this for anarchy." And when I read that, I got kind of, you know, you, you get a little twitch, like, "Oh, that's not the right definition of anarchy." Um, but then just under that, in parentheses, he says, "In a sense, this is exactly what anarchist intellectuals envision from a truly anarchistic society." So when I say, "Don't mistake this for anarchy," I mean, "Don't mistake this for chaos." The distinction is important. So here's an article in Forbes making a distinction between anarchy and chaos, and using, um, you know anarchist intellectuals to say that. So people who are introduced to this for the first time can now understand that there is a difference and are introduced to the idea of intellectuals uh, you know, having an anarchist philosophy. So that's really, really cool. Um, and then there was another sentence here um, that was really awesome. He says, uh, empowered individuals are more valuable to society and the economy than anything on offer from a top-down collective society. So. Yes. So I had watched a video. It's on YouTube. It was uh, with Newell. He's mm -hmm. uh, one of the owners of the company. And he was talking about, you know, why they've ad adapted this non-hierarchical management model um, and so he was talking about and it actually is, is touched on in this article too the military model is dying alongside the rapid growth of technology hierarchy itself is becoming irrelevant as the importance of originality goes front and center anyone can duplicate uh, any programmer worth his salt could replicate Facebook or Angry Birds the trick is doing something new so Newell realized that the industrial model of 
assembly line management wasn't going to work in this new gaming industry and software. You needed people that were making something completely new every day. And so I think it kind of reminded me of something that I think was uh, adapted by Google where they would have a FedEx day where you could just work on anything you wanted once a week. And I think they just took this to a, a, a greater level and they can do this every day. Yeah, um, and it's it's really interesting, and it seems to be well. You and I are of the opinion that, uh, and by, backed by facts, that uh, this is actually much better for humanity. It is a better model all around. Always has been. Um, I don't know if maybe at some point, maybe the, during the industrial revolution, or like they mentioned, this this military stuff. Um, you know, when this type of model was needed, maybe that was best for that time. I don't know. Who's to say? But um, a model of of sort of, uh, you know, level authority on projects like that uh, seems to promote all of the great qualities in humanity, really. And, and not just promote them, but use them. Uh, which right now I think they're being underutilized. I know they are. It's sort of the reverse of what it should be at this point. So all of the um, creative, free-thinking, uh, lateral thinking, critical thinking kind of people sort of get pushed to the side in the model that we have now. It's sort of you must do what you're told, Speak. Listen to the experts. You're not an expert, so you don't know. Um, your boss tells you what to do, and their boss tells them what to do, and it's just a chain of command down the line. And that type of personality is the su success, or the the successful ones. But um, it really does stifle innovation and uh, a whole lot of other things. But in a non-hierarchical model, and we're just talking about management here. We're not talking about uh, complete lack of hierarchies. Someone still owns the company. Um, so that's kind of an important point uh, because I feel like we do need some form of hierarchy. Um, but this sort of model... Well, right. The owners uh, of this company. Right. Yeah. So somebody owns it um, and gives some kind of direction. Uh, but... I think it's probably just, you know, make video games. Let's see what you come up with. Um, but this does promote these wonderful qualities in human beings that will really help to move everything forward and sort of create happiness uh, in society and in individuals as well. So I think it's really cool. Um, and I think it's going to keep going because... Yeah. It's got lots of potential. I think once people sort of start to understand this, they're going to be like, "Ah, oh, why were we doing this the other, the wrong way for so long? Why, why right. didn't we try this sooner?" Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and Valve is the kind of company that's going to attract a certain kind of person capable of taking an initi initial creative step in something too. So, uh, and and they're free to do creative work, um, and that would make them want to stay. So. I think it's interesting that it was also stated, it was stated in the video that I watched, and I think it's touched on in the article that you were referring to, that it takes people that have come from uh, a different sort of management company, uh, like six months, to really adjust to the idea um, of this kind of freedom and trust, trust really being important. Um, I know that one of the, one of the uh, original originals from Valve wrote a blog, um, and he spoke to uh, something. It's hardest to evolve to believe is the level of trust available to anyone in Perforce, and anyone at Valve can sync up and modify anything. Anyone can just up and work on whatever they think is worth doing. Steam Workshop is a recent instance of someone doing exactly that. Any employee can know almost anything about how the company works and what it's doing. The company is transparent to its employees. Unlike many organizations, Valve doesn't build organizational barriers to its employees by default. It just trusts them and gets out of their way so they can create value. Um, 
And so some of these these new hires will come in and it'll take them a while to adjust. And I guess they even have like Gabe Newell has a nickname. They call it like the be beaten wife syndrome of all <laughs> things. So every time they sh would show initiative, uh, someone smites them and it takes them six to nine months to to really feel comfortable that they can show initiative and and that nobody's going to bash them down for it. Just Right. That makes sense to me. And I would imagine that there are people because we're raised in the opposite sort of uh, model. So uh, people just aren't used to it and I would imagine that there are some people who could never get used to it. It just would not be something that they're comfortable doing. They've, they've maybe been successful uh, in a sort of authoritarian model for their whole lives and they I mean, we've seen this as unschooling parents. They just don't want to change. A lot of people don't even, it goes right over their head. They just don't understand it. And they don't, they kind of don't want to. They're, they're happy in, in the way they are. So I think, um, and this sort of brings us to uh, the school in the cloud, which is another, while I was reading this, I immediately thought of the school in the cloud. And I thought, well, this sort of all is pointing toward the future. It's just, it's, it's happening all around us. It, it's sort of, you know, as uh, voluntarists, we kind of always are trying to get this message out and we're talking about how to get more people on board, how to show more people what we're talking about, how to create understanding. And some of us talk about revolution, violent or otherwise. Uh, but this is a different sort of thing. This is kind of just sneaking up right alongside and taking over. And um, in a model like the Valve Corporation has, um, you, or it would be ideal to have people who are used to that in the first place who are raised like that. And school in the cloud, um, maybe we should just introduce that really mm -hmm. quick. Um, school in the cloud is a, uh, there's a man named Sugata Mitra, and uh, he is, um, well, he won the uh, $1 million TED Prize in, what year was that, 2013, 2014? Um, just recently, <laughs> either this year yeah. or last year. Yeah. Um, but he's created a model of schooling where, just I'll just give you the layman's term, or the layman's sort of, description of it. Basically, uh, there is a, a facilitator or two, um, a whole bunch of computers, and a whole bunch of kids of whatever different ages, and they're in a room. You ask them a question at the beginning of the day, a big question. It has to be big open-ended or maybe not open-ended, but uh, sort of uh, what is nuclear fusion, something like that, and you're asking nine-year-olds. or and, and you say, go ahead and figure this out and um, they work however they want, they go at their own pace, they build their own groups, they do whatever they want and, and there's never somebody directing them at what to look at and how to figure things out. Um, and it's it's worked out brilliantly. It, it's shown to, and kids from all walks of life no matter who you mm -hmm. are, excel under this model. Um, and, and the kids, I mean, they were doing amazing things with this. They were teaching themselves languages in, in order to use a computer. So he would give them a computer that was not on. It just would be just a computer, and everything would be in English. And this is in, like, India and other places, too. He's, he's done this. And the children would have to not only learn how to f turn it on, but they'd have to figure out what it's saying because it's in a completely different language and they do it and super quick too. So this is sort of an insight into how amazing this kind of mm -hmm. model can be. It sort of unleashes the yes. potential of the human. Right. So, the, I, his experiment that he performed was called the idea, it was the hole in the wall. Mm -hmm in that groups of children learn on their own without any direct intervention. It was conceptually explained by Mitra uh, as minimally invasive education. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he's tried it over and over and it's become bigger and he kind of wants to move this, and he is moving it to be, you know, in sort of the realm of everyone. So 
people are taking it on more, understanding it more, seeing how well it works, uh, and they are. So, and I, I don't know. I wish I knew stuff. You know how quickly it was catching on, stuff like that. But um, it seems to be really, uh, you know, gaining traction. And so, combining the two, combining raising children under the school and the cloud model or the non-invasive education model um, and combining that with getting a job at a place that has a management or has a uh, structure like Valve, they seem to go together really well. I don't know that those kids would have to take six months to figure it out. They would just already be have the confidence and understanding to do it. So Exactly. They've already de-schooled. Mm -hmm. as an unschooling term, the period of time that it would take a child to come out of school and be left to just sort of figure out how they would organize their own time and what they want to do, self-directed learning or family-directed learning. Um, I've heard lots of different terms for it, but um, it's a process to get out of the old way of thinking that somebody's going to tell you what you need to do and that you're going to do it. Mm -hmm and be in charge of yourself. Yeah, I've, I've seen that that's a little bit difficult for kids who have gone through school to wrap their mind around. They, I think it's a matter of, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm, you know, this is just my experience, but I think it's a matter of fear and sort of, um, I don't know that they feel lost, but they, they subconsciously, they don't quite understand how that works. Even if you tell them rationally and they understand rationally, their body and mind isn't in sync with how that actually happens. So they're they're sort of still waiting for somebody to scold them or to um, make them do a bunch of worksheets. Or they're still they still have this sort of residual. I don't want to learn anything because learning's boring. So it, it, you just have to let them settle into it, which is the de-schooling part of it. Right, but it, and it's not impossible for a child to spend some period of time figuring that out and then adapt to that and understand that and, and really take off with it, but it is, I think, trust is paramount. Um, and it's, it's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and finding mm -hmm. that again when that's been sort of schooled out of you your whole life. And so we start out in school, and then we go into work, and then we're in in similar work environments. And so, I, I it makes complete sense that it would take somebody six to nine months to adapt to this. And right. and he does say there is a sink or swim. There are people that just don't adapt, and they know very quickly that they're not, not going to adapt mm -hmm. to this to this model of management. Yeah, I can see that, and I I think that's kind of unfortunate uh, so but again it's we're all raised in this sort of authoritarian paradigm and some people have a really hard time seeing their way out of it and even if they can understand it they're they're so habituated to it that it's just sort of impossible to change at that point um, and it is it can be kind of unnerving. Sometimes I talk to you about it saying it's like swimming in the middle of the ocean because it kind of is. It's you, it, it's much easier or more, I don't want to use the word lazy, that's sort of the wrong word, but it's in, in the paradigm that we live in now, things are kind of cut out for you. You're born and everybody just tells you what to do, takes you through the steps until you have a career and you're on your own. And even after that, actually, because you're in your job, somebody's still telling you what to do all the time. So you, you sort of yeah look outward to the external world to find out what to do. So when it's a it's a definite shift in perspective to get that intrinsic motivation and to sort of carve out a path for yourself, um, which is also why I'm excited about this because I think it'll be a lot easier to do that when more people. Are doing it. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting that um, some more traditional managed companies will have, they'll try to almost force this 
upon the employees with team building or group exercises or you'll even in like university or college you'll you'll have like the group projects and it's still very top down and directed and I think that the, the idea is that they're trying to foster the environment that I think Valve is really organically developing or it, it's just sort of organically happens because people are trusted and left to their to work things through between themselves and to move freely the desks are on wheels there are no offices I guess they started out with offices he really wanted everyone to have their own office their own door with a lock so that there would be this there wouldn't be the sense of people peering over and seeing what you're doing all the time but um, people were tearing down walls and moving out into the, the group areas mm -hmm. because they were trusted so this stuff that's sort of um, forced actually is happening in a company like this which is interesting yeah yeah um, <laughs> something interesting is that Valve uh, I know I just know personally because um, my significant other does this for a living. He's a video game developer. So I told him about the topic we were going to talk about today and how Valve has this model. And he said, well, of course they do. There isn't another way. So for this particular uh, field, making developing video games and probably other um, technology on the internet and yay internet because this is what's sort of ushering in all of this wonderful stuff for humanity I feel like it's it's really taking the place of the state thank goodness like it's it's pushing it out of the way so people can yeah. see and um, but anyway back to what I was saying is that he he doesn't see how a company that makes video games can work in any other way um, and I've seen uh, he he did work for a different company that um, they had a their office was so cool I took a, a tour a few times um, and he actually never works in the offices he works from home and he works with people from all over the world no matter who he's working with and he's considers himself a freelancer and so does everybody he works with so they're they're pretty uh, individuated they they just do the same thing I mean they they hook up with other people who are doing projects throughout the world and they create video games um, and usually there's there's an owner or a project starter um, somebody who's an old hat at this and who you know is in charge of getting people on board for the project but that's a very similar thing but he doesn't have to go in an office um, he just works from home and even now he's working with somebody who doesn't even speak English but there's a translator on uh, I don't know Google or something has a translator so that's they're working with this man in a different country who doesn't speak English and they're doing fine um, with him so I think that's really cool but uh, oh, I was talking about the company that he worked for um, they <laughs> I walk in and it's like a it's like an arcade it was just I mean there are pool tables and ping pong tables and big couches and everybody just sitting around doing whatever they wanted it just looked like a recreation hall I was like this is a job that's awesome um, but even that yeah even that model was more restrictive than what he does now um, because you still have to go into an office and you're still are assigned this and that but at this point uh, oh, the 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 model that we're talking about that valve has is the model that's used in most gaming um, businesses game developers so because it's what works it makes sense they and I think you need to I, I mean my son plays games and I'm not a gamer but I'm certainly enmeshed in it some degree you have I think you have to be able to make quick decisions to improve things too so if you had to go through the channels of management all the way to the top to make a decision it could be too late and then the next company's already innovated and done that and you're left you're left behind right even yeah. just in maintaining the platforms that you're using or you know the games that you have out there now I know they're always working on improvements and updating and adding new levels or realms especially like the online games the multiplayer 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, they always have to come out. It's it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty booming that industry. They mm -hmm. they have lots to keep them busy. I mean, with the apps on the on the phones and um, different platforms online, and just all of these advertising. I mean, there are tons of things that they have to cover, and so they're constantly on their toes doing you know things all the time. And that's something that's interesting too. I hadn't thought about this before, but I can see how people might be like, well, without management. Nobody's going to be motivated to do anything. How are you going to hire all these people who, and then they're just going to sit around and do nothing because they're not the owner. They don't have the incentive. Um, but what what ends up happening, and I've seen this with children too, um, or unschooling children, um, not public school children, but unschooling children, is that they motivate each other. So they'll start in and nobody's a slacker. In fact, they are amazingly motivated all the time and they're always working and they're always thinking and they're always in contact as asking each other, you know, about questions here and there. So it's the opposite of um, the employee going into work and just doing the minimum that they can to get the paycheck kind of thing. So they, they're not invested in the work that they're doing because they're not own, they, they're not they're not the property owners of it, and they don't they're not making the profit from it. They're just making a paycheck. So um, even in a business model, um, mm -hmm. this works better. Right, and it might not, I, I think it's important to say too, it might not always look like something amazing is happening, but you do need those periods of, uh, like for an unschooler, of boredom to jump to the next idea. If you're just doing busy work in school and if you're just doing work to make your boss feel like you're being productive, you're probably less productive and certainly less innovative. So I think this is this is pretty pretty neat. Mm -hmm. I think so too, and I, I just, I think it has such potential for changing our whole world. And I think it's not just that; it's that we're watching the world change before our eyes into something that, that at least you and I know to be a much better existence for everyone. So it's very exciting, and it's sort of like we. I don't know, I felt like reading this that we don't have to worry so much about it. Um, we don't have to go out there and be keyboard warriors and try and change everybody's minds constantly and, and feel so uh, overwhelmed with all these people who don't understand and all these questions they have and how are we going to get from here to there. It just seems like a huge daunting task. But um, when you see stuff like this, you realize it's coming no matter what we do, no matter what you and I say, it's it's on its way. Right. It's already here. We're just we just have to watch it unfold. Um, so it's that's being built right alongside the old. And if you like the old, the old's there, and you can have it, and you can go be part of that. And the new is here too. And jump on in. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, we're all about letting people choose their life path. So whether that's working in a strict hierarchical corporation firm um, or a really free sort of uh, you know non-hierarchical manner, it's you can do either one. They're both they're yeah. both there. I just personally as as think free that. to choose. As long as you're mm -hmm. free to leave, free to choose. Yeah. But I just feel like once this gets going, and when once the both education and the business models change, um, it's going to show itself to be a lot better right off the bat. So that y you might have to be crazy to open a <laughs> a hierarchical corporation in the future. Um, I think that, although I'm sure there will be a bunch of different models that people use for different sure. things. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just exciting. So, um, I know we had a lot of stuff. It is.
I think we're just about out of time. There was a little delay. I'm not sure if you're back. I'm here. Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which stinks. Yeah. I know. Um, we we had more to talk about with this subject. We uh, might have to so. do a part two. <laughs> yeah, I think we might. Yeah, it's it's kind of a big topic. So. And I think we'll continue okay. to show. We'll we'll continue to highlight the the, the solutions to. Um, you know the ways that the ways that um, things are changing positively and towards a more voluntary society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of what we're about. So I mean, it's everything that we're about. Right. But you can catch us every Saturday morning on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Then a.m. to seven thirty. A.M. Eastern Standard Time, and I want to say thanks to Mike Shanklin again for the next. Okay, it says stop.